Everybody, welcome to the Landlord Survival Show. This is your host, Steve Rosenberg. I am the owner and co-founder of Empire Industries Property Management. And today is Tuesday, the day after Thanksgiving, which means probably everyone's a little bit heavier, probably rethinking their week like I am of what I shouldn't and should and should not have done and eaten. Um, and uh, we kind of start going towards what we're going to do for next year. You know, we start kind of going, okay, this is about the time we got to start dusting off the goal sheet and decide what are we going to do and how are we going to get our stuff done for next year. And by the way, did we accomplish what we wanted to? And, uh, you know, we were talking about this in the hall, me and Alex, I'll introduce in a minute. Um, we were talking about how a lot of people, you know, they, they plan uh, January 1 or probably December 31 at about 10 p.m. It seems like they pull out their goal sheet and they decide to look at it at that point because they haven't looked at it since January 1. Mm. And they go, hey, I wonder if I achieved any of these goals. And what's interesting is most of the time they haven't. Maybe they've gotten halfway through one or maybe they got one of them done and they probably had 20 you know, and what happens is, is they take that end number and maybe take the eight and maybe turn it into a nine and they go, you know what, maybe I'll make this the 2019 goals and then they'll take it and they'll stuff it back into the filing cabinet and they'll hope and pray that next year it'll come back around and they will reach their goals. And I have learned that that for some reason, oddly enough, doesn't work. <laughs> and, you know, one of the things that I have learned about investing and just reading and educating myself is this is a very slow, boring thing to do. When, when you want to become successful and you want to, at anything you do, you have to learn that craft and you have to focus on it and make it your primary goal. Um, I have the tendency personally of bouncing around to different ideas and they call it, you know, water filter, squirrel, whatever you want to call it. Um, of whatever is catching my eye. If it's a shiny object, I'm kind of looking at it. Uh, but I've been really trying to train myself the last year to focus on one thing at a time. And that has really helped me be more focused and more effective um, at it. And I've learned that a lot of people think that they're much more productive by bouncing around to different things. And they call that word multitasking which the reality is, is there's no such thing as multitasking. It's your alternative tasking. You do a task and then you have to shut your brain off and rethink the new, next thing you're doing. You, your, your brain cannot physically do two different things at once, um, which means you're doing one and you're ignoring the other and you're doing it by rote or, or memory. Uh, but what I've learned by doing this and focusing on one thing, my goal was to create this podcast, create this show, and really help investors understand that when they're owning a property, when they're buying a property, whether it's one property, five properties, or 50 properties, they own a business. And inside of that business, there's laws, there's regulations, there's income, there's expenses, there's all these things that go along inside of this business. The IRS says you're a business. Fair Housing says you're a business. Texas Property Code says you're a business. Texas Real Estate Commission says you're a business. And the one person who doesn't realize that they're a business is the owner. And they wonder why one out of three landlords get into a lawsuit every year for some form of lawsuit or litigation based on violating one of these laws. And so what Pete and I wanted to do is we really wanted to reach out to these investors and, you know, I'll introduce my guest, like I said, in a minute. But, you know, Alex, right now, I don't know if you know this, but 82% of all properties in the U.S. are managed by self-management. Mm -hmm. Only 18% roughly are managed by property management companies. So me being a property management company, even though there's a bigger pool, there's not as many people in there as there are self-managers. The, the challenge most of these self-managers run into, and, and we're going to talk about what you do and how you deal with that, is they're not running it like a business. So not only are they destined to fail, but they almost put, they almost tarnish the industry of how we're perceived as investors in the real estate, what we do, what you do at Jet Lending. And, and so my goal is to really help educate these investors to become more aware that number one, they are running a business. It takes a lot more time to focus and strategize on this business than to actually pull the trigger and buy a property. And I tell people, you know, you don't think about how you're going to run the business the day after you close. You should be thinking about this much, much upstream 
before you even think of buying a property, you should think of, okay, how am I going to set up the system to have this give me the return that all of these gurus are telling you 30% cash on cash, this ROI, that ROI. Um, you have to remember that somebody ha that actually has to happen month after month, year after year. It doesn't just magically happen on its own. The journey doesn't finish when you close on the property. That's actually ground zero. Now the rubber's meeting the road and now you have to figure out how am I gonna make this work? How am I gonna pay back my lender? How am I gonna, you know, the business model for getting a property fixed? So what I'm getting at is Pete and I created this website. It's called selfmanagemyproperty.com. And on this website, we do it totally for free. We dump a lot of information on there for the average investor that owns one and two properties. And it's the things that we have learned at managing over a thousand properties to give these people to have a successful business. Because as an investor myself, I've learned that the more people we help, the more it comes back to us. It, it just does. I, I don't know how it happens. I'm not a, I don't believe that much in that stuff, but I know for a fact, the more people I help, the more my name gets out there in the industry as someone who's helping. And we have gotten much more business on the property management side because of that. Um, one of the things that we did is we created the ultimate landlord survival handbook. And we found that when we start talking to investors, and I'm, I'm curious your take on this, if I ask them, do you know what the seven protected classes are? They don't know. I say, okay, do you know the difference between a therapy animal and a service animal and what the distinction is between those? They don't know. Do you know what Texas property code is and the things that will get you in trouble with certain time frames and things that have to be done that is by Texas law? They don't know. So that told us that there's a huge void in this industry that nobody, you know, everyone shows you how to buy the deals. But nobody shows you how to actually get the money out of it for the next 20 years. And I think it's a, a disservice to our own industry of dealing with investors because nobody is actually telling you this. They're just selling people on the front end. And, and we all know people like that in the industry that, you know, get people on the front end that, that make their money when you buy a property and, you know, they sell them the, the, the stuff. There's good guys and bad guys. We all know. But there's nobody that actually shows people on a daily basis of, okay, what do I do when my tenant doesn't pay their rent? How do, how do I handle that? I've got bills. I've got mortgages. I've got issues. What do I say to them? What, what do I not say to them? What, what could I say that could get me in legal trouble? And, and that's what I think is, is lacking in this industry. So without further ado, uh, my good friend Alex Buriak is here with Jet Lending. Alex, thanks for coming. I know you drove a ton of long way to come here, so I really, really appreciate it. Uh, Alex wanted to do this by Skype, and I said, man, I... We could, we definitely could, but I would, man, I'd love the interaction here at the thing. So I thank you so much for, for coming today. Hey, no problem. No, I mean, we're happy to be here. <clears throat> okay. So tell everyone, you know, a little bit about yourself and, and jet lending, um, what you guys do, how long you've been around and, and then we'll kind of dig in from there. Uh, so, um, you know, I'm, uh, their senior loan officer over there at jet lending and, uh, we've been around. So basically, um, January one, 2001, um, you know, Johnny Hayes, Eddie Gant, two owners of Jet Lending, they uh, sat down, they came up with a plan. Mm -hmm. They came up with a good business model of, of things that they knew, uh, how they can help people buy more real estate. So we've been around since then. Uh, we, you know, they've seen and we've seen um, the ups and downs of the markets. Uh, yeah, 2001, nine months later, hello, you know. <laughs> yeah, we went through 2008, we went through Harvey, the, the, all the floods. They are out on the streets, not only looking at houses, purchasing houses, things like that. So they use their expertise in the market to really help people look on the front side of things before they buy it to say, Hey, are you, you know, are you realizing that this is going on in the market? Right. Do you want to go forward with this? Right. Right. So, and then basically as a hard money lender, you know, we help people, uh, if they're buying things that normally they couldn't afford on size or volume on amount of properties. You know, we're a good outlet on, on buying things, especially distressed that you can't go to a bank with. So tell everyone, you know, sometimes I think hard money is a, is a, is a misunderstood word because people don't, you know, sometimes I just think they're ignorant, you know, because they don't take the time to learn what a hard money lender does. And maybe they heard a bad, bad story about it and they go, oh, you never use a hard money. And I'm like, why do you say that? Well, that's what I heard. I'm like, well, maybe you should educate yourself before you shoot your mouth off and say something that you don't know. So maybe you could educate people a little bit on what is hard money. Why would someone come to you as opposed to going to a Chase bank and, and, and start there? Because I think that you guys provide such a vital service. And let me just say this, that 
you know, I think that the way that we are going to rebuild after Hurricane Harvey is through investors. Investors are going to rebuild Houston. It's going to be a long process. But banks are not going to loan to investors to rebuild those Harvey houses in a lot of instances. Mm -hmm. This is where you guys come in, jet lending, and you are able to help bridge that gap, essentially. Mm -hmm. So tell everyone what hard money is, the basic definition, and kind of let's explore that. So basically, hard money is called hard money because we lend against the hard asset. Okay, so we're asset-based lenders. So you're, when you say asset, the house, you're, you're loaning against that physical home. Correct. Okay. I didn't know that's, what, that's where the term came from. That's so, so the hard money means hard asset, the oh. actual structure of the property. Okay. So basically what we look at is we will lend up to a certain amount, up to 70% of the after-repaired value. So we're lending against what will be, not what is. So when you say, when you, and again, I'm just trying to break this down a little bit so, so that I understand it, but also for our listeners. Um, when you say the after-repair value, that's after somebody buys it, they fix it up, and they go, okay, it was worth 70000 After it's fixed up, it's now worth 120000 Right. And that is the after-repair value of the property. Right. So the, the projection projected value of after after it's all fixed up that 120 that you just said that would be what I'm lending against at 70% of that number okay so we're you know a great medium of where when you have to buy something very quickly or very distressed sure. where you can't go to a bank a bank's going to go we're not loaning on that right you know we're going to lend against that value and you know we're a great way of either when you're buying trying to buy something that really big or a lot of properties since we buy in some sorry since we lend off the after repaired value there are times where you may not be coming out of pocket at closing because the spread we, we the spread is large enough right so you know when you have a certain amount of money that you need to invest you use hard money lenders so you can go into a property fix it up and gain that return whether you know your plans were to fix it and flip it or fix it and rent it and hold it for long term for that wealth we're a great avenue for that so what what is the well, let's start with this what is the average is there an average time that people would get a hard money loan for because it's not you guys aren't married for 30 years mm-hmm. you know it's it's a short term bridge loan basically a gap what is that? Is there an average time or average is usually six months? Okay, uh, it goes you know as low as um, you know two months and go as long as two years. Um, it really depends on on what you're projecting for your project. You know, I always tell people to really make a good you know return. You want to be in my loan as small amount of time as possible right because we're higher interest and things like that because we're fast and we're lending on something that's distressed you guys are solving a huge problem but again it's it's that that window that you're solving is a very Mm -hmm. small window for people and they do people understand that or do i mean i I, obviously you guys educate them um but even though you say it do they understand it they have to be reminded by about that. I'll, I'll answer you because, I know that. <laughs> because I will talk about it in the beginning and we want to be in a short amount of time. But I think sometimes people get into that. Well, I'm in a loan, so I'm going to be in here for a while. We'll say, no, you know, you want to get in, you want to fix it, you want to sell it or you want to fix it and let's refinance it to make sure you can hold it long term. I always tell my people and with the education side of things, even if you're planning on flipping this house, you should have at least three exit strategies in place and plan just in case you need to make changes. Right. So and, and that that's a great that's a great way to to put it to people because I think a lot of people they think, "Oh, I bought it. I'm going to take a break for a while. I think I'll go on vacation." And you're like, "No. Oh. This is actually where it starts. You you need to speed up, not slow down once you close on that property." And I think a lot of people think like, "Oh, I'll relax a little bit. I got I got 6 months. I got plenty of time." When they don't realize maybe cuz they're they're not used to doing this and and having that time constraint and Obviously, you're telling them, hey, I mean, at the end of the day, you're making money on it. So, it, you know, they want to hold it for whatever, but you don't want to put them in a bad position to where all of a sudden now you're the owner of this crappy home that's half done and you got to figure out what to do with it. So l- let me ask you. This. So l- let's just say this house, we'll, we'll use this example. It was worth, they bought it for 70, worth 120. Is that, is that a deal you would do or what, what are the ratios you like? Give me, give me a standard ratio. So when I, depending on what, what, their, what their long-term plan is on either flipping it and, or renting it, let's talk about rentals. That is, could be a good ratio, the 120 and they buy it for 70, but what I also look for is a third number. What is it going to cost 
to fix the property. That, that was my next question. So so let, let's say, what what is a deal? Let, let's just use these numbers again. What kind of numbers would you say will do that? Like 20 grand, 30 grand? What do you? Um, for that, so if we're looking at rentals, if I was going to, in that property, you know, 20,000, that means you're in it for 90, your value is 120 with your holding costs. It seems like a good return cash, you know, on that, on that type of investment on a rental. So yeah, that looks good. What I'm more concerned about is when they're into something like that and those ratios, I'm going to project what they're coming out of pocket at closing. So I'll look at that and say, hey, are you okay as an investor for your business to stay in business? These numbers that I'm projecting here, are they okay? Do they meet your plan for business? Do you want to buy this house? How, how, many, how many times are people off in fantasy land on what the real, what, you know, you're looking at it from a mathematical equation. You're looking at data. Mm-hmm. A lot of times investors are looking at it on emotions, right? So they're buying on emotion. They're, they don't want to believe the numbers that you're saying. Maybe they think that you have an ulterior motive and you're saying, hey, look, this is the data that I have. These are the comps. This is what it will rent for. And, and look, I, I, we get it with investors all the mm-hmm. time. They say, I, you know, the house rents for 1500 but you know, I etched my name in the floor, so I want 1900 because I birthed my kid on this floor and I think it's worth more. And you're going, look, I don't care what you did, the market is the market, and the market is saying 1500 So you're setting yourself up for failure. So how many investors do you get that are disillusioned that you have to kind of put them back? Or, you know, a lot of times also, and, and before you answer that, I think this is where a challenge comes in with a lot of wholesalers Mm -hmm. because you know once you wholesale that property you're done it's no longer your problem or you sell the contract whatever you do and i think that's where all of a sudden greed starts coming in because the investor's going wait a second i got ripped off i was told it was 1800 they're new maybe that this is they they don't know how to pull comps they've never done it what happens when you have that conversation with the investor well that usually happens like when they're when they're buying it from a wholesaler they're they're looking at it, they get this emotional attachment to this property especially if they've put money down yeah and so when i look through the comps i'm trying to protect you yeah okay i'm trying to make sure that you're okay i'm a guy that's kind of you know trying to close loans for you i want you to buy 30 properties absolutely so i don't want you to get burned on this one property so you know it usually happens when someone's just getting in um, they, you know, they went to a class or they really like the wholesaler. They talked to them like, well, that's what I they connected. said. Yeah, we had a connection. Yeah, yeah. You know, they wouldn't, you know, tell me this wrong. I'm, like, I'm letting you know, I have no interest in this property. I have interest in you. Right. So I want to make sure that you're protected. These are what we're protecting. I doesn't mean I'm right or wrong, but this is what the data shows. It's, mo- it's, it's, it's an inanimate, unemotional Number. It is a number. It's a, it's and th- it's funny you say that because whenever I talk to investors and I do a lot of one to one strategy sessions and wealth building and stuff like that, and you know I tell them I say, listen, this buying a property is the same thing as buying stock, which is the same thing as buying intellectual property or buying a business. This is just a vehicle, mm-hmm. which means it's a strategy to get you to an end goal. And we talked about goals earlier. Same thing as buying a stock. Same thing as buying a business. It is it is an inanimate object. The numbers in this financial picture are telling you a story. Whether or not you choose to look at them, and the biggest reason, I forget who told me this a long time ago, the biggest reason most investors or people fail is because of laziness or greed. One of those two things causes them to fail because they choose not to look at the story of what it's telling you. Because you know, I could look at that and go, man, that's been renting for fifteen hundred a month, and that looks like a good deal. Because two years from now, the market's going up. There's a school going in. There's a railroad. There's this. There's that. And I've just talked to myself into why it's a good deal, as opposed to you going, yeah, but today these are the numbers, and you need to look at that based on the numbers. Mm-hmm. And I, I, I could imagine you have to do. You could either be loved or hated by wholesalers. Because sometimes you have to tell people, you know what, you want to get it, you can get it. I'm just telling you from the numbers, this does not make sense. Or do you not go that far with them? I don't like to go to the point of if, um, directing their investment because I'm not a financial planner. And yeah, like that. So yeah what, it's, a, it's a slippery slope. Right. So what I do is I say, this is what is projected on what the past has shown. Mm-hmm. I can't help you with the speculation of the future, but does that risk meet your expectations on what you want to do in business? Do you want to be in this property? And, you know, we'll look at the rents, um, make sure that you calculate for HOAs, any kind of um, things that are going on with the property that you all, you're making sure that they're all in numbers in their business plan is evaluated so they know if I close this deal, it's 
they're okay with the risk because there is risk Absolutely. in real estate. There's, well, there's risk in anything. Mm-hmm. And the, the more educated you are and the more you let the numbers dictate to you, and, and I think that's the biggest tip. I We get a lot of investors that, that buy properties. And we tell them, listen, if you are going to buy a property, I don't care if you're buying it from one of our realtors that are have been trained by Pete and I how to work with investors. You're buying it from a wholesaler, a regular realtor. I don't care. If you are buying a property and you want us to manage it, it makes sense to bring us into the equation and say, hey, Steve, do these numbers look right or am I missing something? Because what I tell investors is I say, look, when everyone's all said and done, we are married in a relationship now because we're the ones that have to make sure that you are renting it for what it says. And, you know, with managing this many properties, chances are we have properties in that area or we pull comps and we tell them, you know, I'm not telling you it's a good deal or bad deal. I'm just telling you based on the numbers that you're being told are not what I'm seeing. Right. Take it for what it's worth. You know, you can choose to see it how you want. But I think what's important, I, I, um, I'm a big believer in when I talk to investors, and I, and I don't know how much you guys do this, but when I talk to an investor and they will tell me this is a bad deal because it doesn't make me any money. Let's say, let's say the cash flow is you know, 50 bucks a month or zero, whatever it is. And they'll say, this is not making me money. And I'll say, okay, well, why, why do you say that? And they go, well, it's right here. The cash flow is telling me no money. And I say, well, what about the other factors? Right. And they're like, well, what do you mean? I go, well, you, let's just say this house, let's say they're buying it in Midtown. Mm-hmm. I go, okay, you're buying a house in Midtown, right? So what is the number one reason people buy in Midtown? Appreciation. Right. Okay. So what would this house be worth 10 years from now? Will it go up? Absolutely. It's Mm -hmm. going to go up. So once that goes up, even if you use that simple 1% rule that people use, which I don't agree with, but anyways, let's say you're using that 1% (laughs) rule. You know, if you're using that, when the value of the home goes up, the value of the rent will go up. Yep. Also, you have a tenant paying down your debt. Mm Mm-hmm. You also are able to depreciate the property. So my next question to them is, do you have a job? Mm-hmm. Yeah, I got a job. I'm an engineer. I'm this, I'm that. Okay, well then, do you care, besides your ego, do you really care if you're making 50 bucks a month or losing 50 bucks a month, but you're gaining, you know, you buy a house for 400000 it's now worth a million 15 years from now. You, yeah, you lost, you lost 30 grand in negative geared cash flow. Big deal. Mm-hmm. You just made 540000 on on that so did you lose it's just the perception of of educating them right i mean it's really important that just like you're saying you need to have a team of people behind you protecting you you have your your real estate people you have your property managers you have your bird dogs you have everybody that's going to protect your your business yeah and so if, true. If you're not looking at all the numbers and all the wealth then you're missing out on the boat that you know it's so true and and the difference between a landlord and an investor, the landlord is dying. It's a dying breed. Mm-hmm. And, and, and what I explain to people is the landlord is the guy who thinks he has to do it all on his own. Mm-hmm. He doesn't understand leverage. And the investor has a team around him. And he sits there and I say, you can make more money signing a contract from your desk than you can running to a house, mm-hmm. then running to get it appraised, then running to Home Depot, then doing this. Then, I'm like, at some point, you will run out of hours in the day. You mm-hmm. cannot own 100 houses and do that. You're going to run out of time or you're going to suck at doing it. You're going to be a shitty landlord. You're going to lose properties. You're going to lose owners or, or lose tenants. And you're not going to be good at it mm-hmm. as opposed to going, you know what? I have a management company that manages it. I've got a lending company. I When I need them, I give them a call and go, here's a deal. Let mm-hmm. me know. And you know, people ask me, you know, even though I own the management company, I, I'm a client. I have properties in my management company. I go look at a property one time. Yep, we like it. We'll lock it up. I, I've got several properties that I have seen one time and I've never looked at again. And the biggest challenge that, and you, you said it so good with the team, the biggest challenge landlords have is they understand how to leverage people. Mm. So they understand I'll get a bird dog for this on the front end. They don't do it on the back end mm. once they own it. They understand the bird dog. They understand a couple of things, but they don't want to look dumb, right? Mm. So they don't they don't want to leverage their brain. They don't they're not okay saying I don't know the answer to this. They they kind of cover it up. They're also good at leveraging money. They're good at going to lenders and, and hard money like you guys at Jet and all that stuff. The one thing that landlords are horrible at, and most entrepreneurs for that matter, is they don't understand the leverage of time. Mm-hmm. And they don't understand that their time is worth something. And every minute they're saying yes to something 
there's a lot of things that they're saying no to. Mm-hmm. And it could be not, you know, you, you could have five deals and they you calling someone going, hey, man, I got this good deal. Oh, sorry, I was running around collecting rent. Right. Well, how much did you lose by running around and collecting rent as opposed to just having someone do it for you? And that's that's a true form of leverage. Yeah, I mean, you're either going to spend time or you're going to spend money. You're going to spend a little bit of both, but Absolutely. it's up to you and how much you're going to spend of which other one. Well, you know, it's funny, and I always tell this story, and it's it just it still to this day, you know, the most successful people that I have ever met in my life and multimillionaires, maybe a billionaire, I don't know if he is, but very, very wealthy people. The one thing that they protect the most is their time. Mm-hmm. And one guy that I talked to and he gave me, you know, he, he, uh, I met him and he said, yeah, I'd love to talk to you. And I said, okay, great. He says, you have 13 minutes. And I was like, okay. He says, sorry. He goes, I like you. Good guy. He goes, mm-hmm. but you know what? I have to protect my time because if, if I give you more time, I'm saying no to someone else and mm-hmm. I can't do that. He said, so I'm willing to talk to you. But you have 13 minutes, and that's all I can spare. So, of course, I spent three minutes trying to figure out what I wanted to talk to him about. So now I'm down to nine, you know. But it's very interesting how protective of their time. And he said, look, man, I can always make more money, but I can never make more time in the day. Mm -mm. I'll never get that back. So I have to protect that, and I have to covet that time. So let's go back to to, – I kind of went off on a tangent there, but (laughs) – let, let's talk about jet lending and, and what you guys do and what, kind of what your sweet spot is. Is it is it, uh, it are you guys you guys aren't just in Houston? You guys are in, in Dallas as well, right? Dallas, San Antonio, Austin, um, and uh, we're working on just making sure that we get um, you know we'll do in Beaumont, um, all these surrounding areas. Um, just making sure that we develop more and more programs for people that are um, that make sense. Yeah, and. Um, and keep it going. Keep keep going. Keep people in business. So, what when you guys do the assessment? Because you guys, you don't take an investor's word saying, "Hey, this is going to be worth one fifty when I'm done." And you're like, "Yeah, nice try. We'll yeah. do our own assessment." How, how do you do that? How does that process work? So when I when I um come I get information coming to me, usually we ask for an application because it answers a lot of my questions. So I look at the property and I comp it. How I comp a property is I look at I, I'll pull a subdivision section. I'll do a subdivision year history, a polygon of major streets and landmarks, a street year history, a street full history, and a rental comp of the same. I look at twenty percent plus or minus the square footage of lot in the structure with reasonable year built. From there, I'll look at all the pictures from the unrehab properties and the rehab properties, and I'll say, hey, listen, that takes me usually around 24 to 48 hours. I'll say, hey, listen, this is what I'm seeing. That's a shitload of stuff you do, I got to say. That's- <laughs> oh, yeah. I mean, we wow. we, we really that's, tr- that's great, man. We really try to protect you on the front end. Yeah, I was just going to say, you know, some people look at it as, you know, you trying to say no to the deal, but you're really, really, you guys are protecting this person from making a stupid mistake right. and putting you in a bad position. I tell people. If I lose you, then I got to go find another you. Acquisition cost. I'd rather keep you and keep building clients that are successful. Lifetime of the client, have them keep purchasing. Right. Absolutely. So I tell you, this is what I project in your appraisal at. This is what I project your what would be your rent. Hey, if we ordered appraisal today, this is what I think it's going to be. Do you want me to do that? We close next week. What do you want to do? So nice. I, we just really look at everything that we can really say, hey, do you want to do this? Right, right. And that's that's great because you're – you're giving them the information, which I think a lot of people do not do. And, and, and look, I know a lot of hard money lenders like you and other people and, and good guys and bad guys, you know, and there's mm-hmm. people that take advantage of people. You know, they take advantage of their greed or their inexperience. And, and I think that's great what you guys do. And you guys have been around for, geez, 19 years, coming up on 19 years. So you guys are doing something right. Mm-hmm. Um, so let's talk about the years coming up, New Year's happening. I'm an investor. I'm thinking, you know what? 2019 is my year. This is it. I'm going to mm. bust out of this thing. What's some advice you would give to investors that are trying to get into this? And what are some, maybe some gotchas that you see coming on the forefront, whether it's in the real estate industry or the financing industry that, that you may want to give some tips on? Um, in the in the 19 year and um, for, for picking up rentals, um, one of the things that you need to be aware of is is the flood houses are okay, but um, just know that the changing of what it costs to fix them has increased. Okay, yeah. especially you know within the higher end homes. Um, it's now, not- why, why is that? Why do Why do you think that's increased? Just price and demand, or yeah, and the actual time it's taking to service these properties, the materials that uh, that are being placed in these properties, you are bare minimum thirty five dollars a square foot. Wow. Okay. I mean, that's a house that's maybe two fifty and below. Hmm. If you're going to be into the threes and fours and five hundred thousands, you're probably in it for forty dollars a square foot. 
Um, so c- making sure that your calculations from what maybe you haven't brought a property in a couple of years, right? Those it's numbers, different. those numbers have changed. Right. Um, there is going to be, especially with the, you know what I'm seeing market wise, um, with the increase of jobs in Houston stuff like that, you're going to start seeing a lot of people looking for houses. I mean, this market is still a very strong market. It's extremely. Um, finance wise, um, you know, you're seeing some, you know, a in like the the rates of your conventional loans and stuff like that are going up um it went up this year you may uh, if you haven't bought a house and you're and you're and you're using fannie mae and freddie kind of properties take a look at that see yeah. where you're at how many properties that do you have you know if you're calculating um your cash flow and things like that you know things have changed uh so just um nothing to be that would be concerning but just redo some of your numbers because some of them have changed. Right. Nothing that would cause you to not move forward. No. I mean, look, real estate's a winning solution. Yeah. I, it's funny you said that. I, I bought a property. Um, well, I bought one with my son, my son, 14-year-old son. He bought a, he bought a rental property. And uh, the rates were a lot higher. Yep. Just in my memory of I haven't I haven't purchased one through conventional lending in a long time. And I was like, is that normal? And she was like, yeah, that, that's, that's what they are right now. I was like. Oh, okay. I, you know, and it's inconsequential to me because it's it, it is what it is. You know, right? Um, I mean, rate should never kill a deal. If, if absolutely, the, if the rate kills your deal, that's a bad deal. A- absolutely, absolutely. And you're or you're you're fixated on the wrong thing. Mm-hmm. You know, I tell people. You know, again, it goes back to people will spend so much more time worried about their interest rate or their insurance quote or this or that, and they never actually think of how am I actually going to get this twenty percent return out of this month after month like what's the mechanism to happen right and they don't do that and they're so they get so locked in and look we all get tunnel vision and, and sometimes we we get tunnel vision on the wrong things and sometimes you don't have people like you guys at jet lending giving that good advice to tell people look don't look over here look over here because this is fixed it, it, it is what it is it's, right. it's good it's bad it just is you know um and I was told a long time ago, sometimes a bad deal is better than no deal. Mm. Take the deal and then reassess it down the road and see how you can fix it. Because the nice thing about real estate, even if you overpay or over this or over that, it can always be fixed over time. Yeah. You know, I mean, I bet you if you bought a house 30 years ago, I grew up in Los Angeles, any house I bought 30 years ago, had I got screwed on price, interest rate, everything, I would still be pretty happy right now if I owned a house in downtown LA. Yep. Would not care what the interest rate was, even if it was at 17%. Right now, I'd be going, you know what? I was the smartest dude on the block. Yeah, you're going to be smiling when that check comes in. Absolutely, <laughs> absolutely. So let me ask you this. What it, it, in 2019, you know, you've got the, the 250 and below price point, mm-hmm. 250 to let's say 500, and then five or maybe 750, and then mm-hmm. 750 and above. Where's the glut of properties right now, do you see? Or do you see coming? Um, what do you mean by glut? Well, some, it, it, you know, a lot of times it's cyclical where, you know, you can't find any house under oh. 250 or, you know, and like you said, the, the, the ones that are a little higher, like, what are you guys seeing that people are getting? Um, right now, um, we're doing a lot of ones where they're like, maybe like 130 and below. Okay. And then, um, where do you find those? I can't even, I, I don't even see those anymore. Uh, there are people, you know, people are still finding their own deals. If yeah. you want a deep deal. Yeah. You know, you're going to find it, but um, there are... What's your time worth? Yeah, what's your time worth? Um, and, you know, also, do you have your business in place for marketing? Yeah. Do you, I mean, are you running your show like a show? Or like Absolutely. A business, you Absolutely. Know? Um, if not, let's say you're like, hey, listen, I'm, I'm over at Halliburton. I don't have time for that stuff. Then you got your wholesalers, but you're going to pay more, and that's okay. There's nothing wrong There's with that. There's nothing wrong yeah. with that. Absolutely. Um, you know, another thing to, that I'm seeing um, move more in property acquisition uh, that was this year, and I think it's going to continue in the 19. Is MLS is back alive? Yeah, um, I think that there's a lot it's of funny how it cycles, right? Yeah. It's so funny. There's a lot of agents that wanted to get into the investment world. They didn't really know how to list the property. They go find that property, and in the in the novice person is going by there and saying, "Oh, they price that too high," and they keep going instead of saying, "Hey, they price that too high. I'm going to make an offer." Yeah, you got nothing to lose, and, and you know it's funny you, you talk about that. There's so many mistakes that investors make and some of it is always they they want to get something for nothing right. and and but yet if you go to their job and you say hey I want you to come in today and work for free they're going to go I'm not doing that but yet you want a wholesaler to work for free or you want a realtor or a hard money lender mm-hmm. and they 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 beat you up on all these different things where but if you ask them to do the same they'd be like I'm I'm not working for free no. but it's okay for me to right they don't see value in it and and that's that's the interesting thing is 
I think they don't get educated on the front end to understand the value of what you guys do. I mean, if and I don't know if people know what you do. Like when you told me all that stuff you do, of, you know, checking the streets and, and all the, the demographics and geographics and everything, history. If they would have said all that and say, yeah, we do all that, but it's pretty much included in the cost. I'd be like, shit, man, that's pretty cool. Mm-hmm. I don't have to do any of that. Like yeah. you guys are going to basically check it for me. How is that not a win-win scenario? Yeah, and I mean, there's no charge for that. We do, don't now, char- do you tell people all the stuff that you're going to do? Yeah. Because that's a huge selling point for you guys. Yeah, I mean, we are to, to listen, I'm I am not going to I'm not going to stamp up and say, "Yeah, go with it." And then I didn't look at it. I'm not going to say, "Yeah, let's order an appraisal and see." Don't get me wrong, you got you got something in Crosby and there's nothing out. I, mean, I get I, it. Yeah. But you got the outliers. Yeah, but other than that, I mean, I, I really want to do a lot of business with you. Yeah. I want to do business with you for the next 20 years. Well, it, you, know? you know, it's funny because when, when we talk to investors, I say, look, my goal is for you to be a millionaire. Mm-hmm. I want you to be a multi, multi-millionaire because that means that you are buying more properties and we are managing them. It's win-win. We're all getting up the hill at the same time. Even if you're self-managing, it doesn't matter, if even if we're not managing the property, but the fact that you're successful is helping the industry overall mm-hmm. because it's so tilted the wrong way with, with 82% self-managing that don't treat it like a business. They don't take the time to go, you know, where's the value and what my time is worth? And even as a lender, I want you to do a lot of business. So when I hear the self-management, I'm like, you are – that does not make you money. Yeah. You go get your management team because your job is to find properties. Absolutely. My, like, my job yeah. is to give you money. Their job is to make sure that there's someone in there and it's being managed. You know, it's funny. I, I always tell it t- when I talk to investors, I say, listen, I say, it's like going to the nursery and buying a tree, right? You want the nicest tree. You're spending mm-hmm. your time. You're doing your homework. You're spending all the thing. I want a super nice tree. You buy the tree. Then you get all the nice fertilizer. You get all the fertilizer. You get the dirt. You check out. You go home. You put it in the ground and you never water it. And it never bears the fruit that it was promised. Mm -hmm. That's the same thing as rental. Everybody focuses so much on the front end. And I tell people what I explain, you know, when I talk to investors, I explain to them, listen, you know, when when we talk about something or they want to know about the tenant or they want to know something that, that legally we can't give them information on, they say, well, it's my house. It's my, you know. And I say, it's your structure. Mm -hmm. It's our business running inside that structure. Mm -hmm. You bought four walls and a roof. We have the business model running inside that four walls Mm -hmm. and roof. And people have a hard distinction of understanding that. I say, listen, you now own a business. Your business is the rental business. You can have the management business, Mm. but now you should learn those things. You want to do it yourself? Knock yourself out. But we all know the end result of what's going to happen with that. Right. Um, And so I, I think that's the, for me, the biggest tip that I tell people is, if you're going to go down the path of self-management, there's nothing wrong with that, but know the the, the pitfalls and the challenges that mm-hmm. happen and educate yourself. Because like you said before, it's all about education. It's all about doing that. Um, and I think what you guys do at Jet Lending, that's awesome that you guys do all that. I just... I don't think that people see the know of the value of everything that you guys do. And I don't know if there's a way to convey that because I've never talked to anyone that has said they know that you do all that. And the thing is, not only when I come in and, and do that, then three other people do it too, just in case I miss something. Wow! So you guys don't want to loan on something, and, no. and, and there's a, I'm sure there's a liability issue if they go. Wait a second, you said that it would rent for eighteen hundred, and it's a thousand. Right now they're looking at you, and they're never they're never going to do business with you again, probably. Right, and you know, and I I, I, I give them all the information and say, here, are you seeing what I'm seeing? I'm not right or wrong, but I'm seeing data. Do you want to take the risk on the data that we're seeing? Right. Right. And, and, you know, again, how they interpret it, whether it's laziness or greed, causes right. them. So um, l- let's go back a little bit. When, when I'm a new investor, what things do I need to think about when I'm talking about getting a hard money loan? So and, and what I mean by that is when w- let's use this, you know, $70,000 house worth 120, it's going to have 20,000. Do you actually give them a check and say, here you go, good luck with the 20? Or do you guys do it on draws based on, like, how does that work? So um, we'll do, let's say we're holding 20 in repairs. So what you'll do is we'll close on it. And then since we have to keep our leverage to the property, what you'll do is you'll start the work. I mean, you can do one draw, you can do three draws, whatever's really comfortable for your plan. And don't forget about when you're running your business, you also have to run your life. So I want to make sure that I'm seeing enough money in your account so I know that you can still run your business and live. So uh, let's say you're saying, Alex, I'm doing three draws. So you do a, a portion of the work, and let's say 
you're like, well, I mean, I need some more money back to pay my contractors. So you schedule a draw. Our guy goes out there and makes sure everything that you said that you put in the house is there. So you ver- so how do you how do you guys verify? Do you get an invoice or do you get a a, a, a work order of what they've done or? So what we do is they'll they'll write down you know off their budget that we looked at before we're closing. And our inspector will go out there and take pictures and make sure everything's done and, and everything's moving forward. And we'll look at the property and say, yeah, those things are in there. We'll reimburse you. One thing that we always make sure of, though, is that you have enough money in your accounts to finish the project. So let's say you had 20 grand in escrow and you're requesting 10. And the inspector goes out there and says, hey, listen, you know, they got their flooring in, they got their paint, everything they said they were doing, and I think they can finish this for 10, give them their 10. But let's say, like, well, man, we, we, uh, we opened up a wall and there was a huge plumbing issue and we spent another 10 grand on that. Well, like, well, we can really reimburse you this, but we need to make sure you have enough in your budget to finish the house. So we always have to be leveraged appropriately. And that's why we always make sure that, listen, get your re- rehab team in the property prior to closing to make sure that they've seen everything. Try to catch everything because you're not going to catch everything. Absolutely. Okay. But, you know, we got always got to make sure that you're protected and we're leveraged appropriately because we, our money comes from our bank lines that we have. So we always have to explain, hey, this is why we're doing this, and that makes sense to them. And so we are just to make sure that you're protected and we're protected. Okay, so one, one tip I got out of that is if you're going to do a rehab, get your crew or, you know, do most people have a crew or do they kind of, are they the crew? Well, it depends on you know, how long they've been doing it, you know, gotcha. um, how, big, how, how, yeah. If you're just doing one, you're not going to have a crew. Right. And then they'll, they'll, uh, they'll hire like turnkey guys and stuff like that, uh, to, to go in and, 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 you know, check out and say, this is how much it's going to cost. And I think it's a smart move, especially if you don't really have much construction or rehab experience. Sure. That's worth the expense of that safety. Absolutely. Um, so, the, you know, I'm more for getting people, their rehab people when they're getting that, not so much inspecting, but getting a rehab bid because I think it's more cost effective for them what they're trying to do. Um, but because it's really what the costs are to fix it. But yeah, that's how we run our draws. You're going to do some work and then we reimburse you. Now, if they don't have crews, do you like, do you, uh, two things, do you provide them with people? And also, do you guys have some kind of punch list of saying, Hey, these are things that you should look for. You know, let's say it's someone who's brand new. They don't know anything. Do, do you guys have anything like that or no? You, is that cross over the lines a little? What we try to do is we try to provide vendors, especially when we got like people that um, are vendors for our event and stuff like that. Sure, yeah. Talk to these people because what we You don't, trust them. You've, you've got a relationship with them. Right. And we try to use people that everybody knows because we don't want to say use this person because then we would be liable for that. Absolutely. Um, and then uh, for a punch list, what I always tell people, especially when you're walking into a house, okay, always – Take pictures. So what I would do is when you go to a house, you know, you take a picture, take a picture of the address first. Because when you scroll through your phone and they hit another address, you hit a new house. Because trust That's me, the they're all going to look the same. Yeah. All right. You come in, you take two pictures from the corners of each room, all your major mechanicals. A big one people forget is pull those attic stairs down, crawl up there and take a picture of the inside the roof. Because hmm. if you see wooden squares, that cedar shake and that has to come off. And yeah. that's a whole new roof. It's a whole other, yeah. You know, if you see everything on the west side of the house, 45 degree angles and the door frame splitting, you probably have an issue underneath you. Yeah. Um, you go, you know, you're, you're, check, you're, you're trying to be a little detective. And if you take pictures of those things and then you send them to me, then you have a second little detective looking for things. Sure, yeah. So we all, again, just back up upon backups. Because that could reflect, they can go back and renegotiate the price right. based on issues that they saw, I mean, possibly, you never know. But, I mean, it, it's giving them some... It's giving them some education of running it like a business, not off of emotions. And look for your big four. Roof, foundation, HVAC, and well and septic. Do you will be surprised how many houses in Houston are still on well and septic. Yeah. So just take, you know, make sure you get your big four out of the way because those are surprise you. You know, you didn't plan for a foundation and all of a sudden you got six more grand coming down the pipe. Yeah. So make sure your big four is good and then be reasonable on your finishes. You know, Plan for the worst, and if that if you're still making money, you're in business. Now, I've always heard, you know, you, you, I'm not a rehabber. I've done it. I'm not good at it. I suck. That's why I don't do it. But um, I've always heard, you know, take the cost, double it, add 10 percent, and then you're you're kind of in the ballpark. Is that do you see? Is that, that's a, that's a bit much. No. <laughs> well, I, I, I said I sucked at it, so that's probably realistic for me. But but I mean, you know, just uh, get uh, multiple bids. Um, you know, the lowest isn't the best. The highest isn't the best. Okay. Um, I agree. Just, uh, just go in there. Uh, and 
remember, just like you know, you've been saying this whole time, this is a business. You're the owner. You're hiring an employee. Absolutely. Check references. What was your last three rehabs look like? Yeah. You know, anybody that has... Go look at them. If you, you know, look at the rehabs of the jobs that they actually did. Yeah. You know, call this. Hey, you know, trust me. Being in business and now you're, you're a business owner, you're going to hit negative things. That's yeah. not... The negative is not what I'm, I'm, I'm concerned about when I hear negative things about other businesses or anything. It's... Did they do well when negative things happen? It's like, how they react when yeah. the shit hits the fan. When that, the shit hits the fan and they solved it, that's yeah. a win. Yeah. And, and you know, one thing, and this is, it's funny you say that because we always tell people, look, nowadays in social media, if someone sucks, go on social media and look at reviews. Yep. You're going to see how, how bad someone is by that. You know, you're going to get a gauge, right? Mm-hmm. You know, like I tell people, we have, I think we have almost 500 reviews on Google and, and we're 4.8. I don't have that many friends and family to lie for me. Eventually, you got to go, okay, these are real. Like yeah. th- These are legitimate reviews that people have. And that's what I tell people. I'm like, you can get a good gauge. And, and I tell people, I, I when I you know used to talk to owners and onboard new owners, I'd say, listen, don't come under the assumption that things are not going to go wrong. Things are going to go wrong. Mm-hmm. There's going to be miscommunication. You're going to get upset. There's going to be things out of your control. Mm-hmm. The true gauge of a company is not if things go wrong because I'm, if anyone tells you it's going to be perfect and we're going to go off in this, you know, under this rainbow and it's going to be great is lying to you. So right. first of all, assume things are going to go wrong. That's why people don't get into real estate. Get into it with the right headset. But it's also when it goes wrong, how they react and what they're, how they fix it. How do they fix the problem? Because we tell owners all the time, if we screw up something, they say, you know what? We screwed up. Here's how we're going to fix it. Mm -hmm. And that's the true gauge of a company of taking ownership of that problem. Now, I I don't know if you have any or you want to give any. I'm curious if the down and dirty for investors of any horror stories, Um, anything that you have that goes, man, that was a nightmare scenario. A lot of guests like to hear those. Okay. So... um just as you know, not as, the first one's not as bad. Just like just as a side note, please check your HOA fees before you do a rental, especially on townhomes and condos. HOAs in general, if you can even have it as a rental, correct. But townhomes and condos too. Before you lock that contract, you got to make sure that you can be a landlord. Exactly. Or if they're not percentage, we had somebody that bought something and then it became a big issue. Um, for them, they didn't use us as a lender, just an, an investor of ours. Okay. But they ended up buying it, and then they had an issue. Um, if you are, you know, when you're buying something that has added square footage, okay, okay, you have to make sure that you are calculating with the original square footage, and then after you are rehabbing the property, then you can take a look at adding that square footage into it but usually as you look at those properties let's say you added 100 square feet i know that's small but just for simple math and it was a hundred dollars a square foot now that's worth 50 right it's worth half yeah okay so when you're looking at things you know just getting that back up and making sure you're with people that understand how to evaluate cost um if you're adding square footage and then you don't you're not going to get the same after repaired value. There are people out there that will, oh, we're adding a uh, thousand square feet and then they fix the house, but they don't add the square footage. Right. Don't do that. Yeah. Um, and I want a horror story, man. A horror story. I'm trying now. I'm trying to th- <laughs> think of, of something where, okay, um, there was a group that decided to buy a house. And do a, a group as in a couple of investors got together. Yeah. Okay, all right. Um, and they decided to. Um, I feel like we're going down a fairy tale story here. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it's, 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 yeah, yeah. You got to. I got it. I got it. Yeah, I got it. <laughs> so, um, let's say push. You know, long story short, uh, when you're rehabbing a house, you never have to bulldoze the house down. Um, that would be a and good. Then, yes. And then um, try to figure out now how to rebuild your house. If you don't like how your rehab's going, then maybe you should just reevaluate some of your costs and not bulldoze it down and then try to rebuild it up. But don't, you know, have that plan, the plan in, so in place. They, wow. So they bulldoze the house down? Uh, well, except for a few pipes, um, which makes I don't... Sense. Yeah, yeah, makes I sense. Mean. <laughs> oh, you know what? Here's a, here's a good safe horror story. Okay. A couple years ago... Um, we were about to close on a house near Galveston. 
Okay. And I'm talking to my guy and say, okay, so what, you guys are closing tomorrow, correct? He's like, yeah. I said, so have you done your final walkthrough of the house? He said, no. I said, so because you're buying, they were buying it from an owner, not like a wholesaler. Mm -hmm. I said, no. Well, I said, well, go in there because if they're supposed to be out, make sure everything that you guys agreed upon that's in that house is in the house. He's like, ah, oh, but and I just got, I said, just go. I said, what are you doing? It's a business, man. Just go check it out. I said, once you sign that paperwork, it's over. It's over. Yep. I get a hysterical laughing phone call about four hours later. And I said, what do you want, man? He's like, the house is gone. I said, what do you mean? He said, the house is gone. I said, what house? I said, he's like, the house we're closing on is gone. I said, what do you mean it's gone? He said, it's not here. It was scheduled for demolition. No shit. Wow. There That's... was nothing left. If he would have closed on that and signed, he would have had a dirt. He would have had a dirt lot. No kidding. Go to your places <laughs> before you close. That is a good tip. Mm -hmm. I never would have thought of that, actually, of, a, of, a, of that happening. Wow. It was gone. Nothing. So obviously he didn't close. He didn't close. Yeah. No, no. <laughs> yikes. Yikes. Wow. Okay. Interesting. So let's talk a little bit about your guys' event. You guys got a huge event um, every month. You guys do it monthly? Yeah. Every third Wednesday of the month. This month, because of Thanksgiving, it's tomorrow. Okay. It's tomorrow. Okay. Yeah. Tell everyone about it, where it is, what, what, why they should come. Because, I mean, it's, it's a mega event. Of course, I don't get invited to it, but anyway, <laughs> that's okay. Uh, no, tell everyone about it because it is a really good event. And it's a very, very good mixing, getting to know people in the industry. And, and it's, it's a good – you guys should be proud of what you guys have created. It's a good deal. Well, it's over at the Redneck Country Club. And uh, we're getting like we do it every third Wednesday of the month. we got about 32 vendors that come up. Anything that you can think of, whether it's rehabbing, AC, you know, they're there. Um, about a thousand people show up a month, and every month is different. There will be special speakers, special topics, things going on. You know how again as a lender, it's not like a, you're not going to see like this huge like jet lending pitch. Right. This is all about education because an educated business person in real estate makes better decisions. Absolutely. People that make better decisions that means I do more business with you. So you got to come over again it's a redneck country club there in stafford um you know free food free beer a ton of education free. who doesn't like free right yeah. free and free yeah i mean just it's it's a great time and if you don't i mean couldn't believe how many people were there doing business i mean i tell people you know a lot of times people you you, you talk to me on the phone you see me on facebook and stuff like that and you, you want to hang out I totally understand. You need to go, and I want you to leave with a stack of business cards. And I want you to get moving in your business. And that's what this event's about. It's trying to get you educated and in the industry. Just like your job right now, you have to be in this industry and in with people that are doing business in this industry. And this is, you know, for, for people to understand, too, whether you're super experienced, whether you're brand new, whether you're not even sure you want to get into real estate, th this is a great event for you to come and test the waters, right? Because you're going to talk to everyone. You're going to talk to people that, you know, like Johnny and that has, you know, several hundred properties and mm -hmm. this and that. And you're going to talk to people that are thinking of getting involved in real estate. So it's it really runs the gamut of, of everything. Oh, yeah. I mean, you know, new uh, seasoned people that use us, people that are lenders, uh, be people that are selling property, they're buying properties, they're fixing. I mean, there's all these types of people yeah. there that you need to be exposed to. Absolutely, you got. And this is the 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 ba this is the spinal cord of becoming an investor of going to these events. And there's there's you know I think you could probably go to a free event every night yeah. of the month. You know, and they and, and again it depends on your education level, what you need, what you want to learn. But this is a great event. Um, now, if they want to get a hold of you, Alex, how do they do that? Well, um, one thing I always tell people, I do a lot of events and things like that. If you want to get a hold of me directly, um, you know, email Alex A L E X at jetlending.com. You can always call my cell phone at 832-584-0986. But you also, I mean, to get a lot of this information we talked about, you go to www.jetlending.com. You call the office at 281-872-7800. Um, you talk to one of us. 
we're, we're more than happy. We are excited to hear you on the phone and excited for you to get into business. So www.jetlending.com. That's 281-872-7800. Again, I'm Alex. We can't wait to hear from you. Alex, thanks again for being on the show, man. I appreciate it. I think a lot of people got a lot of good information. This will be replayed on Facebook and every other social media. So again, guys, go to the Redneck Country Club. It's tomorrow, and it's also the third Wednesday of every month. Um, make sure you mention my name when you walk into the door. Uh, but anyway, hey, uh, appreciate everyone listening, and we will see you guys next week on the Landlord Survival Show. Bye-bye.